I'm David Woods. I'm a professor at The Ohio State University here in this wonderful facility. And a colleague of yours, who's also a specialist in resilience engineering, posed a key question to all of us and to me in particular. Why do reliable systems fail? Well, you have regular incidents all the time that threaten outage of valued services. There were multiple visible outages in late 2021 with widespread effects that went well beyond the initiating organization and cut across many levels with Facebook and Amazon and other major organizations involved. What does it reveal? A basic signature of complexity and the barriers it brings, that we can have reliable but brittle systems. And as complexity grows, as our interdependencies grow, that problem of the risk of brittleness also becomes more and more critical for us to address. How do we outmaneuver complexity in a world of growth and surprise? You're growing, you're successful, you deploy new capabilities, you provide additional valued services to a wider range of stakeholders. Yet, as we see in these incidents, surprises and challenges still occur, and as we experience in society, challenges other places go backwards and influence your organization and your systems as we've experienced in the pandemic. So the question we are asking in this, what makes systems robust and resilient in addition to reliable? And that's a special form of adaptive capacity that's necessary if we're gonna see resilient performance when shock, challenge, and change occurs. This form of adaptive capacity is resilience as extensibility. So we're posing a simple question to you. Can you build and sustain your adaptive capacity to outmaneuver complexity? So why do reliable systems fail? Well, let's cut to the chase here. First is you have excess brittleness and it's unrecognized and it's okay because it turns out everybody does. The issue is, are you recognizing it and working to reduce it, to manage it, to outmaneuver these complexity penalties? Now, you can build robustness, and you do, and you can always do more. Unfortunately, the science shows us there's a hard limit on how much you can get from the search for robustness, given the way growth and surprise creates complexity penalties. And the third part is you have sources of resilient performance, but you don't understand them. You don't appreciate them, you don't provision them, and you don't sustain them as much as you could. You end up being reliable but brittle. So how do we cope with that? Now, this reliable but brittle is the signature of complex systems. What it means is what we see is a surprising sudden collapse of performance against a backdrop of continuous improvement and injection of new capabilities. This is a general finding. In fact, this isn't a finding, this is a theorem. Not only is this a theorem, it's a proven theorem. It's 20 years old. It turns out that the pressure to pursue optimality, if you don't add in the right kind of resilience and robustness, will increase the risk of brittle collapse. And that's why we keep seeing these repeated issues of, of near collapse or actual loss of valued services, as I indicated. And when we study this in across the whole range of biology, including us as part of the biological world, what we discover is that biology abhors reliable but brittle systems and biology builds in a form of adaptive capacity that we're talking about. Now, who am I and how do I know about this stuff? Well, what we do is we go out and for the last 40 years, we've been studying how people cope with complexity, how they adapt. You, me, all of us as we adapt to cope with complexity. And we've been doing this for decades across settings in hospitals and space operations, at wildland firefighting, military operations, flight decks, all kinds of different settings. When we study these the empirical patterns in these wildlands is that some people, not all people all the time, but some people are the critical resource that provides the adaptive capacity for resilient performance that counters this risk of brittle collapse. And you can call that colloquially snafu catching. That was a coinage by the American GI grunt soldier in World War II, situation normal all effed up, right? The side that was doing well and had all the logistics still had these messiness undermining our plans and expectations about how our system would work. Outmaneuvering complexity requires us to know how to architect and design in adaptive capacity in layered networks of organizations and technology. And that's a pretty exciting thing, and that's a place where you're at too. 
Why do reliable systems fail? Complexity penalties offset the accompanying growth and change because of finite resources. Capabilities grow, scales expand, pressures intensify, gaps will develop, and those gaps will only be visible in the anomalies, exceptions, and surprises that occur at the boundaries of your competence envelope. And it requires this extra uh, extensibility of uh, adaptive capacity to fill the gaps. As this found sign says, your system was never broken, it was built this way. But the key here is given new capabilities, finite resources, and continuing change, right, these adaptive cycles are fundamental in what goes on. So the issue turns out to be not your reliable system sometimes fails due to brittleness, but why don't brittle systems fail more often? And we've already indicated it's due to this adaptive capacity as a readiness or potential to change how the system works now. Despite its improvements and successes and growth, it needs to change right, in the expectation that some of the places you made choices about finite resources and the way success happens and gets adapted by other human roles in other organizations will continue to produce anomaly surprises. You have to be poised to adapt. Right? A readiness to revise and a readiness to respond. It's a preparatory potential in advance of experiencing a specific challenge. If you wait till you're in the middle of the challenge, it's too weak, too slow, and not nearly as effective as we need. Now, people demonstrate some of the properties that go into this adaptive capacity, initiative, reciprocity, this readiness to revise. We want to understand this resilience as extensibility. It's absolutely essential. It must be there, otherwise the risk of brittle collapse is too high. What I want you to remember when we study this and understand this is, is this simple line. Resilience is a verb in the future tense. It's about how you build capability that will be needed in the future, which is of course why it's hard to sustain because it doesn't look necessary or even looks inefficient now. And so management can easily under provision or poorly provision the key people who provide this resource. We've said it's about reliability, robustness, and resilience, right? And that the key is to sustain robustness and resilience, in particular resilience as extensibility. Robustness is improving the system's competence for specific, well-understood challenges. And the catch is you can't know them all. And inevitably, whatever the planning process you go through, whatever the algorithms you create, however you do it, holes will appear when surprise occurs. Now again, this is a theorem. This is a hard limit on how this works. It's called robust yet fragile. It's 20 years old. There's limits to the competence due to those finite resources and continuing change. So resilience as extensibility from a very practical point of view is kind of simple. How does the system handle the next challenge case it will experience when that case is different than the ones you've faced before in ways that reveal the gaps in past plans and competencies? what you've been good at won't be good enough in the future. And when that happens, the second question is, how does the system deploy, mobilize, and generate the adaptive capacity to keep pace with the spreading challenges, disruptions, cascades that play out over time in these situations? So being reliable and robust is are, are great, but insufficient. When you lead with resilience, you get a big robustness benefit because you have to continuously be examining and correcting your investment in building robustness. Now we can see this in many places. I mentioned those different areas we've studied it, in intensive care units, in emergency rooms, in the interplay of intensive care units and emergency rooms. We see going solid. We see how do you anticipate to keep pace. We see effects at a distance to grade diagnostic search. We see uh, the need to manage the cost of coordination. These are all things we see in all these different settings, including yours. What do your challenges look like and how are they changing? How do you deploy, mobilize, and generate adaptive capacity to respond? How can you architect your systems and as a human and technical and social and collaborative system to provision future adaptive capacity? The same stuff that works, the, the good stuff, and the same stuff that makes things worse, ugly, appear in the ICU and in aviation, and they also appear in your world, because these are fundamentals that we see and we can take advantage of in designing and architecting your system to be better able to cope with the messiness 
that accompanies and complexity penalties that accompany growing capabilities. So thanks to uh, Laura Nolan and, and Lauren Huckstein, we have some commentaries on a couple events that happen close together at one of your parallel companies. And what's interesting in this is the factors we're talking about play out, tales of migrating saturation. The story Laura and Lauren tell about these two cases are stories of how saturation is triggered in bills, how adaptations help and hurt and hide what is going on. People are trying to adapt ahead of running out of the capacity to continue to maneuver as events produce different forms of overload and different parts of your technology start to respond. Now we see many, many different patterns here that we see in other places as well. One of the big things here is not a counterproductive behaviors as you approach sat saturation. You see working at cross purposes. Uh, you see maladaptive steps and responses. A lot of it is, you know, is hidden and hard to see. Even some of the automated compensation, while helping, also hides what's going on. And the saturation potential and overload happens to your ops personnel, happens to the incident response system, and also plays out across organizational boundaries because it doesn't stay, these in incidents don't just stay within one organization. So in cases like these they talked about, and the ones you've experienced as well and will experience in the future, did there, does your network design provide the adaptive capacity approaching saturation? Well, I've got good news and I've got ugly news. The good news is you do design in behavior at saturation. You do a variety of protective things. You do a variety of sensible things. That's why your systems work as well as they do at scale. But when we have incidents that threaten outage or even produce an outage of valued services, the ugly comes to the fore. Because the way you've designed your system to behave near saturation, right, is at least according to the fundamentals that we've worked out empirically and theoretically, they're kind of incoherent, they're ad hoc, they are uh, often late, they have unintended consequences, they're very weakly saturated, and the big thing to emphasize to you is you can't see any of this very well. It's really, really hard to see what's going on. So approaching saturation with the need to extend your capacity for maneuver, but these different triggers, their effects, the impact of responses, given the interdependencies, are obscured. So the future, I would suggest to you, and particularly this company and its position, is to think about these questions. What perspectives reveal how saturation builds and moves and migrates? How does it show responses that are helping or undermining? Can you see how others are coping? And can you act to help those because you can see where they're running out of uh, capacity to respond and you can anticipate early right, and mitigate the spreading cascade of effects. If reliability is insufficient because of brittleness, what can you do? My message is simple. You have to value robustness and resilience as well. You have to step back and realize no matter what, no matter how good you are, no matter how talented you are, no matter the uh, investments you make, you are subject to missing the forms of excess brittleness that are present in your system, in part because they change, and they change because of growth. And these unappreciated sources of, of resilient performance need to be dug out. They need to be looked for. They need to be investigated. They need to be reinforced. The limits on, on your competence are hard to see. They're not where you think they are, and they move around. And you generally overestimate the size of your competence envelope. It changes the shape of the surprises at the boundaries. So what would I like you to do? And when you value these, I think you need to think about a very simple change. Expand the reference of the term SRE, Site Reliability Engineer. And the S doesn't even really refer to site. It refers to all of the layers in your technical organizational, all of the layers in your stack, human and technological, development and operational, and put in the three R's, not a single R. It's about the resilience and how that builds robustness so that you can go further in reliability as you grow and scale. You need to build the potential for continuous adaptability, which is what I recognized when I first got drawn into the world of DevOps and CICD, that this is a uh, path to the future. To be poised to adapt, to switch to S3 R's E. Some of the key things that are going on today are the processes for learning from incidents from people like John Allspaul, Richard Cook, and uh, many others. Lessons for management's adaptive capacity. 
because we keep finding that management, when these challenges grow over scales, right, as complexity produces more interdepend interdependencies, that management is often slow and stale and struggling to keep pace with the changes and challenges. Insufficient adaptive capacity at the management level needs to be addressed, as well as how they provision the rest of the stack. All of the layers in your organizational tech stack have to be poised to adapt. And in that process, it changes what the E refers to, because it really refers to resilience engineering. Thank you.